Deep learning on 3D objects? Finally! Hello world, it's Siraj, and geometric deep learning is an emerging field of machine learning that's able to learn from complex types of data, like graphs and 3D objects. In this tutorial video, we'll learn how to use geometric deep learning to classify groups with similar interests in a social network and apply it to 3D object classification as well. In the last decade, deep learning algorithms like convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks have allowed us to achieve unprecedented performance on a broad range of problems. We can now classify images, recognize speech, translate languages, generate pickup lines, and some of these metrics have incredibly already surpassed human capability. It's been incredible to see the progress that's happened, but a lot of the algorithmic techniques that have been used to achieve these breakthroughs are actually pretty old. What's been the real catalyst for the deep learning revolution so far has been the availability of new types of datasets that have been generated. Whether it be the Atari dataset for DeepMind's deep Q learning algorithm or the chess game dataset for IBM's Deep Blue Victory, also GPUs, and Hinton's Blessings. The dataset point is important because in the past few years, we're seeing more and more of a special type of dataset, 3D objects. Thanks to companies that have democratized tools like the Kinect that are able to capture 3D point clouds of objects, not just 2D images, we now have a wide variety of 3D objects available to train models on. Once we do that, we can classify them however we'd like or even generate new objects. Graphs are another type of emerging data set. We can consider social networks as graphs, where the characteristics of users can be modeled as signals on its version. Vertices. The sensor networks are another example. Distributed, interconnected sensors have readings that can be modeled as time-dependent signals on graph vertices. In genetics, gene expression data is modeled as signals defined in the regulatory network. Graph models are also used to represent anatomical and functional structure in the brain. You would think that we could just feed this type of data to a deep neural network and assume that it would be able to properly parse it, right? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. neural networks aren't that great at interpreting this type of data. The reason being, deep learning generally works well on what's called Euclidean data. Graphs and 3D objects, that, those are considered non-Euclidean data sets. Let's break down the difference. Euclid was a Greek mathematician who wrote a book called The Elements over 2,000 years ago where he outlined the geometric properties of objects that exist in flat two-dimensional planes. That's why Euclidean geometry is also known as plane geometry. Euclidean geometry is pretty straightforward, pun intended, lol. It has its own set of rules, like the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, and two parallel lines will never cross, and the shortest distance between two points will always be a straight line. Euclidean geometry is still practical and has been used by modern engineers to design buildings, predict the location of moving objects, not die, and survey land. We can also use it to help us define data. For example, we can consider an image as a function over a two-dimensional plane. This function can help us define the image intensity at a specific coordinate on the 2D image plane. And if we need the value of the image intensity at another pixel, a certain number of units along the X direction, we can just plug that new coordinate set into our function. This property is very useful if we want to define a convolution. Convolutions are one of the main building blocks of convolutional neural networks, the type of network best suited for image processing. The term convolution refers to the mathematical combination of two functions to produce a third function. It merges two sets of information. In the case of a CNN, the convolution is performed on the input data with the use of a filter to then produce a feature map. We execute this convolution by sliding the filter over the input. At every location, a matrix multiplication is performed and sums the result onto the feature map. It's one of several operations that make these networks work really well on image data. But if we curve the image so it becomes a 3D object, we can't just convolve around a 3D shape using vectors like we did for 3D images. That means we need to redefine the whole notion of a convolution. Non-Euclidean geometry encompasses this type of data, whether it's a sphere, a shapeless 3D mass like Ditto and 
Pokemon, or a graph of some kind. A lot of the most interesting data types lie in this category, from protein interaction networks, to knowledge graphs, to the entire World Wide Web. The non-Euclidean nature of this data implies that there are no familiar properties like a common system of coordinates, vector space structure, or shift invariance. We need a neural architecture that can learn from non-Euclidean data with the kind of accuracy that CNNs give us for Euclidean data. Enter the Graph Convolutional Network, or GCN. GCNs are very powerful models, so powerful in fact that even a randomly initialized two-layer GCN can produce useful feature representations of nodes in a given network. We can think of a general graph-based learning problem in the following way. We're given a set of nodes, each with an observed number of numeric attributes. For each node, we'd like to predict an output label. We have labels for some nodes, but not all nodes. We're also given a set of weighted edges, summarized by an adjacency matrix. The main assumption is that when predicting the output for a node, the attributes and connectivity of nearby nodes provide useful contextual information. GCNs can solve this problem. They are neural networks that can operate on graphs. A good a good way to imagine what's happening is to consider a neural network that receives as input a set of features from all nodes in the local neighborhood around a node, and outputs an estimate of the associated label. The information from the local neighborhood gets combined over the layers via the concept of graph convolutions. The deeper the network, the larger the local neighborhood. We can think of it as the generalization of the receptive field of a neuron in a normal CNN. This network is applied convolutions evolutionally across the entire graph, always receiving features from the relevant neighborhood around each node. Let's talk more about how these graph convolutions are defined by applying a GCN to a real-world graph. We have a social network data set here of football enthusiasts that are divided into two groups, FC Barcelona fans and Real Madrid fans, and this is represented as a graph. Barcelona is the better team, but that has nothing to do with this. Nodes represent members of the network, and the edges are their mutual relations. The leader of both groups is denoted by a respective letter. We can build our graph convolutional network by first initializing it at random to produce feature representations. Then we'll stack our GCN layers using the identity matrix as a feature representation. So each node is represented as a one-hot encoded categoric variable. Our GCN will take as input a feature matrix that includes the number of nodes and the number of input features for each node. It also takes as input the matrix representation of the graph structure. Each hidden layer of the network corresponds to a feature matrix where each row is a feature representation of a node. At each layer, these features are aggregated to form the next layer's features using a propagation rule. So features become increasingly more abstract at each consecutive layer. Our simple propagation rule consists of the weight matrix for a layer and a nonlinear activation function, ReLU. So the size of the second dimension of the weight matrix determines the number of features in the next layer. This is reminiscent of the convolutional filtering operation from regular convolutional networks, in that the weights are shared across nodes in the graph. We can easily extract the feature representations from the graph and plot it in a few lines. It cleanly separated both sides and we haven't even started the training process yet. If we start training, our output graph will get way more accurate and this demonstrates the power of GCNs. Pretty dope, right? But social network graphs aren't the only type of Euclidean data sets. We can also use GCNs on 3D objects if we consider them as point cloud data. Point clouds are just a set of points represented in 3D by their XYZ locations. It's what hardware like the Kinect generates. It's computing not just pixel data, but depth as well. So there's a third dimension involved. If we consider the points in a point cloud as nodes in a directed graph, we can apply GCNs to them. There has been several work in this space. Just this year, a paper titled Dynamic Graph CNNs used a GCN to improve feature extraction from point cloud data. There are several variations here, SplatNet, PointNet. There are different types of graph convolutions and different pooling architectures designed to work well with point cloud data. This space is moving fast, so expect to see even more improvements in the next few months. But we can already use several of the freely available models on GitHub ourselves to build products and services. There are three things to remember from this video. Deep learning generally does really well at extracting useful feature representations from Euclidean datasets. 
Euclidean data follows the laws of Euclidean geometry. It's grid-like and follows rules involving straight lines and points. Geometric deep learning models like graph convolutional networks help learn from non-Euclidean data like graphs and 3D objects by introducing an ordering of mathematical operators that are different than in classical convolutional layers. Did this video give you an idea for a startup? Share it with us in the comment section and please subscribe for more programming videos. For now, I've got to visit the fifth dimension so, thanks for watching.